Good evening. I'm Harriet Hamasi, Dean of the Library. It's really great to see such a wonderful crowd here and still having people come in. Uh, it, it's really a delight. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's uh, Tannis Family Endowed Lecture. Peter J. Tannis, college class of 1960 and member of the Library Board, established the Tannis Family Lecture Fund in 2010 in honor of the Lounger Library's 40th anniversary. Since its inception, the Tannis Annual Program has featured outstanding speakers, including Dennis Lockhart, Ray LaHood, and Georgetown's own professor, George Akaloff who is here with us this evening, along with his very significant other. <laughs> We're ever grateful to Peter and Anne for their generous gift, which has allowed us to bring such exceptional speakers to campus, including tonight's extraordinary program. Please join me in acknowledging and thanking Peter for his generosity. It is my honor to welcome President DeJoya, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Well, thank you very much, Dean Hamasi, for your leadership of our library and for your many efforts to bring us together this afternoon and for moderating our conversation a little later in our program. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I want to thank you for joining us here in Lorfink Auditorium in Hariri Hall for our annual Tannis Family Endowed Lecture with the Honorable Janet Yellen. And Dr. Yellen, it's wonderful to have you here with us with your family at Georgetown. And I wish to offer my gratitude to the members of the Tannis family, to Peter, uh, who have joined us for this special event. I want to thank you all for being here and for making it possible for us to gather in this way. I'd also like to extend a special welcome to the Honorable Selwa Roosevelt, former Chief of Protocol of the United States, as well as Ambassador Edward Gabriel of the Kingdom of Morocco, and Ambassador Dina Kawar from the Embassy of Jordan. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. This afternoon, we're privileged to have the opportunity to hear remarks on the past, present, and future of the United States Federal Reserve from one of the foremost economists of our time, the Honorable Janet Yellen. There are few people better equipped to share reflections on the state of the Federal Reserve than Dr. Yellen. She served as a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System for 14 years prior to her appointment as chair, a position that is sometimes referred to as, quote, the second most important person in government, close quote. When President Obama appointed her to the role in 2013, she became the first woman to serve as the chair of the Federal Reserve. In her time as chair and throughout her extraordinary career, Dr. Yellen has demonstrated what her predecessor at the, at the Fed, Dr. Ben Bernanke, described as, quote, a lifelong commitment to using what she has learned as an economist to improve the lives of average people, close quote. As chair, she focused on how the Fed's work could shape the job market and address inflation, striving to improve conditions for American families who have been deeply impacted by the Great Recession, working to build an economy that could benefit all members of our society. Prior to her time as chair, Dr. Yellen served as president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, where she played an important role in identifying the key factors that would shape the coming financial crisis, particularly in the housing market. She has also served as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, chair of the Economic Policy Committee of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and is Professor Emerita 
at the University of California, Berkeley, where she has served on the faculty since 1980. Currently, Dr. Yellen is the incoming president-elect of the American Economic Association and a distinguished fellow in residence with the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institute, where she focuses on monetary policy strategy and financial regulation. In an interview with The New Yorker, Dr. Yellen reflected on the reasons she originally felt drawn to economics, noting that the field provided, in her words, quote, a rigorous analytical way of thinking about issues that have great impact on people's lives, close quote. Her career is an extraordinary testament to both her rigorous intellect and her attention to the impact of the economy on individuals and families. We're grateful to Dr. Yellen for her leadership, for her commitment to public service, her addressing complex economic issues facing our nation and world with thoughtfulness and rigor, and for offering us this opportunity today to engage with her reflections. So thank you all for being here this afternoon, and I now wish to invite Dr. Janet Yellen to the podium to deliver today's address. Thanks so much, President DeJoya. It's an honor and a pleasure to speak tonight at Georgetown, and I greatly appreciate the invitation to deliver this year's Tannis Family Endowed Lecture. Thank you, Peter, for all that you've done for Georgetown. My topic this evening is the Federal Reserve, its past, present, and future. I've been privileged to work in the Federal Reserve for a considerable portion of my career. It's an organization I consider truly exceptional, filled with dedicated professional individuals who are devoted to public service. My first stint was as a staff member in the board's international finance division in the late 1970s. That stay ended quickly because I met the love of my life, now a professor here at McCourt, and at that time a visitor at the Fed, in the board cafeteria. In 1994, President Clinton nominated me to serve as a governor of the Federal Reserve under the chairmanship of Alan Greenspan. I later returned to Berkeley to teach, but was tapped in 2004 for a different role to serve as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, one of the 12 regional reserve banks that are part of the Federal Reserve system. That assignment placed me right in the midst of the housing boom and bust that precipitated the worst financial crisis in the United States since the Great Depression. I worked with Chair Bernanke and other senior Fed leaders to contain the crisis and to craft monetary policies that would promote economic recovery. In 2010, I moved from San Francisco to Washington to serve as vice chair of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors, and in that capacity, I continued to work with Chair Bernanke on monetary policy and on crafting financial regulations designed to prevent a future financial catastrophe. As President DeJoya noted, President Obama nominated me in 2014 to serve as chair, succeeding Ben Bernanke, where I continued this work. This evening, I'd like to share some reflections on the issues I focused on during my time as Fed Chair. I'll outline my priorities, describe what I see as the accomplishments and setbacks, and discuss some challenges the Fed faces now and in the years ahead. Of course, I know you may have questions, and I intend to leave some time uh, for them. When I became chair in February 2014, I set out two main priorities. The first pertained to monetary policy. I sought to craft a monetary policy that would foster continued economic recovery and the attainment of price stability. I hoped and expected that with the economy recovering from the financial crisis, 
it would prove appropriate to normalize monetary policy, namely to gradually scale back the extraordinary monetary policy measures that were put in place after the financial crisis. My second priority was to do everything possible to make the financial system safer and sounder, thereby reducing the odds of a future financial crisis. This involved completing the implementation of the reforms mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act passed in 2010, working to improve our supervision of systemic banks and enhancing our capacity to monitor the financial system as a whole and not just the banking system for incipient threats to financial stability that might emerge and could be responsible for a future crisis. So let me now talk a bit about each of these areas. I'll start with monetary policy. With respect to monetary policy, my focus, first and foremost, throughout my entire tenure was on jobs. As you know, the financial crisis took a huge toll on the American economy. Unemployment reached 10% in 2009, which is close to a post-war high and nine million jobs were destroyed on net. In addition, many people who lost long-term jobs dropped out of the labor force completely, giving up hope of ever finding work. A large share of the workforce also found themselves stuck in part-time jobs when they wanted to work full-time. The African-American unemployment rate stood at a not very low 8.3% in 2006, it rose to a horrifying 16% in 2009. So my focus and the most important priority was to foster recovery of the labor market, a return to full employment. It's difficult to determine when the economy has achieved full employment, but current conditions seem quite consistent with my interpretation of that mandate. During my term as Fed Chair, the unemployment rate declined from 6.7% to 4.1%, and it now stands at 3.8%, close to a 50-year low. The African-American unemployment rate is now 6.7%, close to the lowest levels in the history of the entire series. This represents substantial progress on the job front. Every indicator of the labor market that I track, with the one exception of the prime age labor force participation rate, suggests a stronger labor market now than in 2007 prior to the crisis. Prime age labor force participation plummeted after the financial crisis, and it's moved up considerably, but it's still about a half a percentage point below its pre-crisis level. It's hard to know how much further it will rise because it's been on a downward trend for about two decades, reflecting the disappearance of jobs for less skilled workers due to technological change and globalization. The progress we've seen in the labor market reflects the efforts and successes of American businesses and workers. The Fed's job was to facilitate this process by crafting an appropriate monetary policy, and I count the improvement we've seen as a policy success. The Fed is also responsible for attaining price stability. Like most other advanced country central banks, the Fed interprets price stability as an inflation rate of 2%. If we look at core inflation, which excludes food and energy prices, and is a good measure of underlying or trend inflation, it was running at about 1.4% when I started as chair. Regrettably, it remained stuck at 1.5% when I left. I argued that the shortfall from the 2% target by the end of my tenure reflected temporary factors that would quickly di dissipate and core inflation has been running at just under 2% over the last 12 months. However, due to falling energy prices, headline inflation is only 1.4%, and recent inflation data look weak. 
the failure of inflation to stabilize around 2% is a considerable concern. After a prolonged shortfall of inflation from its 2% target following the financial crisis, there is a risk that inflation expectations could drift down, which would likely pull inflation yet lower. You may wonder why we and other central banks do not aim for zero inflation. One fundamental reason is to create a buffer against the opposite of inflation, that is, deflation. Deflation is a generalized and persistent decline in the level of prices, a phenomenon Americans last experienced during the Great Depression of the 1930s, and one that Japan has confronted for much of the past two decades. Deflation can feed on itself, leading to economic stagnation or worse. It puts pressure on employees, employers to either cut wages or cut jobs, and it can be very hard on borrowers who find themselves repaying their loans with dollars that are worth more than the dollars they originally borrowed. You may have learned in school about farm families in the Great Depression who could not pay their mortgages and lost their homes and their livelihoods when crop prices fell persistently. Another important reason to maintain a modest inflation buffer is that too low inflation impairs the ability of monetary policy to counter economic downturns. When inflation is very low, interest rates tend to be very low also, even in good times. And when interest rates are generally very low, the Fed has only limited room to cut them to help the economy in bad times. Turning finally to the stance of policy, as I mentioned, the Fed had put in place an enormous amount of monetary policy accommodation. And our hope was that with ongoing recovery, we could gradually scale it back during my term. In the immediate aftermath of the crisis, by the end of 2008, the Fed cut overnight rates to near zero. And they were still at zero almost six years later when I became chair in 2014. Once short rates were lowered to zero, the Fed struggled to figure out what more it could do to promote recovery. We noticed that even with short-term interest rates at zero, longer-term interest rates remained pretty high in the years after the crisis. In 2011, for example, they stood around 3.5%. These longer-term rates determine the cost of fixed-rate mortgages and are relevant to many investment decisions. So we sought to pull down these longer-term rates through two unconventional means. Our first strategy was to offer forward guidance, intended to convince market participants that short rates would stay low for a very long time longer than those participants would likely expect on the basis of past experience. For example, the FOMC pledged in 2013 that short rates would likely remain at zero at least through mid-2015. A year later, we pledged that short rates would remain at zero at least until the unemployment rate fell below 6.5%. Our second strategy for pushing down long-term rates involved purchases of long-term assets, commonly called quantitative easing. We bought longer-term treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities backed by Fannie and Freddie with the objective of pushing up their prices and lowering their yields and thereby lowering borrowing rates. In pursuit of this interest rate objective, the Fed purchased about $3.5 trillion of securities between 2008 and 2014. It's difficult to determine exactly how much these two strategies moved rates, but longer-term rates did fall, as we hoped. Eventually, they declined below 2%. In a recovering economy, such extraordinary support becomes less needed. And absent some scaling back, 
we could see the economy overheat and inflation rise above desirable levels. The job of deciding on the right pace to scale back support involves difficult judgments and careful assessments of the risks that would be associated with different po possible policy paths. At the start of my term, with unemployment still too high, the recovery still a bit fragile, global conditions pretty weak, and little scope to cut rates if the economy were to falter, the FOMC, that is the Federal Open Market Committee, judged that caution in scaling back accommodation was in order, and that the risks of scaling back too much or too quickly exceeded the risks of moving too slowly. We ended up raising the short-term funds rate only once in 2015 and once again in 2016 before picking up the pace in 2017 with increasingly robust growth. By the end of my tenure, we had raised the Fed funds rate five times, taking the target range for the federal funds rate up to one and a quarter to one and a half percent. During 2018, with increasingly robust economic performance, partly due to tax increases and tax cuts and increases in government spending, the FOMC raised the target range four more times. It now stands at two and a quarter to two and a half percent in the vicinity of estimates of a neutral rate that neither boosts nor retards economic growth. Economic growth this year looks to have slowed. The FOMC recently estimated that it would come in about 2.1%, considerably lower than the 3% growth achieved last year, but close to estimates of the economy's longer run potential to grow with a stable unemployment rate. As I mentioned, inflation is running near, but still on the weak side of 2%. Under these conditions, the FOMC has placed policy on hold as it evaluates the economic outlook. There is no presumption that short rates need to rise further. Further increases would be likely only if inflation moves up or appears very likely to move above the Fed's target. Cuts could be in train if the economy falters or inflation chronically undershoots. In addition to normalizing the level of short-term interest rates, the FOMC also began the process of shrinking the size of its balance sheet during my term as chair. We announced a plan whereby we would redeem, rather than reinvest, some of the principal that comes due on our portfolio of treasury and mortgage-backed securities. The plan was set in motion in the fall of 2017, and the FOMC announced this past March that it will conclude the rundown in September. Starting in October, the Fed will begin reinvesting maturing principal that comes due. The Fed also recently decided that its operational regime will be significantly different going forward than before the financial crisis. Before the crisis, the quantity of, federal re of, of Fed, Fed reserves in the banking system was very small, about $20 billion, and these bank deposits on the Fed's books paid no interest. To change the level of short-term rates, the New York Fed bought or sold Treasury securities to slightly alter the quantity of reserves available to banks. Almost every day, the New York Fed intervened in the markets to keep interest rates near target. After the financial crisis, the Fed was granted the power to pay interest on the reserves that banks hold in their Fed accounts. And when the Fed began raising its target for short rates at the end of 2015, it relied on this tool, namely it raised the interest it paid on these reserves to push up money market rates generally. This tool has been used throughout the recent tightening cycle, 
and this operating regime is working quite well, so the FOMC has now decided that it will remain in place. It allows the Fed to avoid day-to-day -day interventions in the money markets, and it's compatible with large reserve holdings by banks at the Federal Reserve, something that banks now want to satisfy new liquidity requirements. From a financial stability standpoint, this regime is also much safer. When the FOMC ceases balance sheet runoff in October, the Fed's asset holdings will have declined to around $3.7 trillion, and the process will have run its course. Balance sheet runoff had the potential to, prom to provoke considerable financial market disruption. Indeed, the difficulty of exiting from asset purchases had been a concern in the committee and in Congress, with some observers anticipating that a rundown of the Fed balance sheet would spark financial bedlam. But fortunately, things have gone quite smoothly. My hope was that it would be about as interesting as watching paint dry. <laughs> and it has mainly worked out that way. A smooth exit means that there should be less resistance in the future to deploying asset purchases again. Looking forward, one of the most important concerns now facing the Fed is how monetary policy can respond to a future downturn. This is the focus of a monetary policy framework and communications review being currently conducted by the FOMC. And it's something you will likely hear much more about in the next few years. I mentioned earlier that one factor affecting the general level of interest rates is the rate of inflation. Another factor is the level of neutral real interest rates. The inflation adjusted or real short rate currently stands around half a percent. And it's now commonly anticipated that the normal levels of real interest rates in most developed countries will remain quite low, far lower than historical experience for a long time to come. A decline in real interest rates was evident even before the financial crisis in most developed countries. And it seems to result from slow productivity growth and aging populations. These two factors boost saving and depress investment, pushing real interest rates down. With a 2% inflation target and a real interest rate of, say, 1%, short rates would average 3%, and that means the Fed would have far less room to cut rates in a downturn to support the economy than it had in the decades prior to the financial crisis. There's a good deal of thinking now about how the Fed can address this challenge. Of course, it should keep asset purchases, as I mentioned, in the toolkit. But it may also be desirable for the Fed to shift its inflation objectives slightly. Instead of seeking 2% inflation at all times, good and bad, the Fed could seek 2% inflation on average over the business cycle. This sounds like a modest shift in objectives, but it means that the Fed would actively try to boost inflation somewhat above 2% during expansions in order to offset a persistent shortfall of inflation during a period like the one we just experienced, when policy was constrained by the zero lower bound on interest rates and inflation ran for many years, six or seven years, below 2%. A shift of this sort would prevent inflation expectations and actual inflation from edging down over time and would, able, would enable the Fed to promise markets that it will hold short-term rates very low for a long time when they hit zero something that should pull down longer-term rates and promote faster recovery. Let me next turn to financial stability. I'll briefly 
review our efforts to substantially reduce the odds of another financial crisis. The US and global financial system was in a dangerous place 10 years ago. I believe that it is now significantly safer. The Congress, the administration, and the Fed and other regulatory agencies implemented new laws, regulations, and supervisory practices to limit the risk of another crisis. We closely coordinated with policymakers around the world. The upshot is that we have a more resilient financial system. Banks are far healthier. The risk of runs owing to maturity transformation is reduced. Derivatives are safer. Efforts to enhance the resolvability of systemic firms have promoted market discipline and reduced the problem of too big to fail. And a system is in place to more effectively monitor and address risks that arise outside the regulatory perimeter. Throughout, we coordinated efforts here with those in other countries through the Basel Committee, the Financial Stability Board, and the Group of 20 to ensure that efforts in one country to tighten standards would not be undermined through shifting of risky activities abroad. We also wanted to ensure a globally level playing field. In terms of accomplishments, most important is that we've increased the quantity and quality of capital in the banking system. The quantity of tier one common equity capital has more than doubled since 2009 among the largest banks. We also required the most systemic banking firms to hold additional capital buffers, reflecting the costs that their failure would impose on the economy. Capital metrics often provide inadequate insight into how firms will fare if a truly adverse shock hits. So we have supplemented those accounting ratios with forward-looking stress tests, which evaluate the ability of the largest banks to absorb very large losses while continuing to lend. The largest banks are restricted from raising dividends and from share buybacks if they do not pass a quantitative test and qualitative evaluations of their capital planning processes. These tests have greatly increased our understanding of the risks in large banks and contributed to better risk management at these firms. Liquidity risk at large banks has been mitigated by a new liquidity coverage ratio. Outside the banking sector, the rules governing money market funds have been reformed and the scale of prime money market funds that saw runs in the financial crisis is now far smaller. We've required central clearing of standardized over-the-counter derivatives and imposed higher capital and margin requirements on non-centrally cleared derivatives to prevent another AIG. The Fed has also massively ramped up financial stability monitoring efforts and the new Financial Stability Oversight Council created by Dodd-Frank was structured to assess threats and foster collaboration among regulators. Much has been accomplished. So I would describe the financial stability glass as half full. But unfortunately, there is a good deal that still worries me. So I would also characterize it as half empty. Let me just enumerate a few concerns. First, there remains an argument that capital requirements should be yet higher. The imposition of these requirements should reflect a cost-benefit judgment. Higher levels of bank capital mitigate the risk and adverse effects of a financial crisis but raise the cost of intermediation in normal times. Even now, U.S. capital requirements are closer to the lower and not the higher end of those that could be justified by cost-benefit analysis. 
In addition, the stress tests I mentioned do not yet capture important avenues for the propagation of systemic risk. For example, they generally do not directly take account of second round effects of stress on the financial system, such as the possible fire sale of assets by financial firms in need of capital or funding. Although banks are generally more resilient, I am concerned that there is an absence of targeted tools that can be used to restrain lending in situations where financial stability risks are deemed to be growing. I'm thinking, for example, of placing limits on mortgage lending, such as a ceiling on the maximum permissible loan-to-value ratio of new mortgage loans at a time when house prices are rising rapidly, generating financial stability concerns. Housing is often at the center of financial crises in advanced economies. Recessions caused by a housing bust tend to be more severe than other downturns. Countries that fear the consequences of an emerging housing bubble are now using such tools to limit credit growth and the rate of house price appreciation. No such tools are available in the United States. I would also note that it remains challenging for the banking regulators to address behavior that gives rise to systemic risk when the concern extends <coughs> beyond the safety and soundness of a particular institution. Recall that in the run-up to the crisis, financial institutions were securitizing poorly underwritten and risky mortgage loans. Supervisors were aware of these practices, but addressed them only to the extent that they posed a threat to banking organizations, say, because the firm warehoused the loans on its balance sheet before selling them into the market. In recent years, similar concerns have, aris have arisen with respect to corporate leverage loans. Bank supervisors have noted significant underwriting deficiencies, weakening covenants, and escalating credit risks. Because many such loans are securitized or sold into the market, they pose limited risk to the safety and soundness of individual financial institutions. However, these loans may pose risk to financial stability similar to those associated with securitized subprime mortgages prior to 2008. A third concern pertains to the rollback of the Fed's emergency lending authorities. In every financial crisis, the Fed has served as a lender of last resort. The Fed used these powers in part to avoid the collapse of systemically risky non-banks like Bear Stearns and AIG. But under Dodd-Frank, lending to avoid the collapse of a financial firm will not be permitted. All that is allowed are broad-based lending programs. The scaling back of the Fed's lending powers reflects a conscious decision by Congress. Dodd-Frank's intention was to end bailouts, so they rolled back emergency lending but in return, they provided a new mechanism called orderly liquidation authority to prevent the calamitous collapse of a non-bank financial firm such as AIG. Although the law has long provided an orderly resolution mechanism for banks, there was no such mechanism in place for non-banks, including the investment banking subsidiaries of bank holding companies and such a mechanism was incorporated in Dodd-Frank. Still, Congress assessed that the preferred form of resolution is through bankruptcy, and it required that the largest firms submit living wills that describe how they could be resolved under bankruptcy. It requires banking firms to change their organization and structure if such firms are necessary to facilitate resolution. The Federal Reserve has taken these congressional mandates seriously 
and worked with the largest banking organizations on their resolution plans. Working with the industry, the Fed and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation have thought through how an orderly liquidation of a systemic firm could be accomplished under bankruptcy or using orderly liquidation authority. But the orderly liquidation authority is difficult given the complexity of systemic banking firms and their global reach. It requires incredible coordination across countries, and it is also untried and unproven. Moreover, Congress has periodically threatened to repeal orderly liquidation in favor of a pure bankruptcy approach, an approach that in my view would be completely unworkable. My strong preference would be to apply these approaches in the event of a future problem, but to retain emergency lending authority as a fallback. Actually, I would go further and argue that the Fed should be allowed to lend to broker dealers on an ongoing basis and not just in a crisis. These entities are now supervised by the Fed and normal discount window access would diminish the odds of destabilizing runs. Finally, I'm concerned that under the Trump administration, we may see a significant rollback of the important safeguards that have been put in place in recent years. After thousands of pages of rule writing, I certainly recognize that there's a need to review and simplify regulations to address unintended consequences and to help community banks that are struggling with costly regulatory burdens. More can be done to tailor regulations to the systemic footprints of the regulated firms, but the current deregulatory fer fervor threatens to push further. further. It is sometimes argued that more stringent regulation has stifled growth. I do not agree. On the contrary, I think the strength of the U.S. recovery in part reflects our, in our aggressiveness insist in insisting that core financial firms build capital. Let me stop there, and I would welcome some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yellen. Uh, as uh, our audience is getting uh, close to the uh, microphones, I uh, would ask that as you prepare your questions that you actually ask a question uh, and, uh, uh, and that you, uh, for sake of time, just keep it to one question. If you don't mind, I'll begin with a, a question. Absolutely. And as people are, are coming forward, uh, we know that you have spent uh, many years of your career uh, in higher education, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that work in higher ed and your preparation uh, really influenced your work as chairperson. Well, thanks so much. Um, I, I have found that um, all, I've, all of the economics that I've learned, studied, taught, and researched has been highly relevant in the jobs that I faced. And um, research is a very important part of what the Federal Reserve does. Um, we have one of the largest and best um, groups of research um, um, economists in the country. There are 300 PhDs um, working just in Washington and a far larger number throughout the Federal Reserve. And um, I, I truly believe that the research function of the Fed, where we have um, attract individuals with um, very solid grounding who are addressing current issues in economics with an eye on uh, policy concerns, that that strength has proved a tremendous asset in addressing the crisis. When the crisis hit, hit the Fed needed to act very quickly, very creatively, and to come up with new programs. Um, and it was that staff trained 
uh, in research, working with lawyers and policymakers throughout the system who devise the innovative uh, programs that stem the bleeding. Um, I, I would say that um, after the worst of the crisis was over, but the US economy was very depressed, and we had to think about what to do to um, spur growth and spur recovery. I mentioned some of the unconventional policies that we used. Um, those ideas all came from research. And in fact, there had been a major effort um, within the Federal Reserve System to think through the question of what can a central bank do once interest rates have been lowered to zero to promote further recovery. And um, that thinking was prompted by the problems that Japan faced um, at a time when nobody ever believed that the US would find itself um, in that situation. And you know that research focus has proved a, a tremendous asset um, when we face those problems. So I, I believe research um, and is a very important component and, and um, asset for policy. Chairman Yellen, with regard to the dual mandate of the Fed, frequently the criticism of the Fed is that there's too much focus on the inflation metric and not enough f focus on the employment metric. But the argument that you just made today about changing to a 2% target on the average of the business cycle that would focus more on the uh, employment metric. Could you tell me about what you think the likelihood of uh, the Fed adopting that metric would be and whether or not the Fed has been fully um, meeting its expectations on the jobs metric, which you were championing during your tenure? Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for that question. So I'm a strong believer of the dual mandate. Um, both price stability and the employment side, I'll say that during the years that I was Fed chair and after the financial crisis, there was simply no trade-off to be concerned about because unemployment was high and it was obviously a priority to bring it down. And inflation also ran below 2% um, for six or seven years running. And so both of those things really called for flat out accommodation, anything we could think of. But with respect to the 2% average over the business cycle, um, the, the, the FOMC is engaged in a policy review now. They have scheduled a major conference at the Chicago Fed in June where they're going to discuss and um, listen to presentations by researchers and members of the public about um, alternatives that they could use. Um, I think there's a reasonable chance that they will go in the general direction that I indicated, although um, it's certainly a lot to think through, and um, I'm sure they have made no decisions at this point. But um, I think the committee recognizes two things, that um, under the current regime, unless they make a change of the type that I've described, there can be a problem on both the inflation front and the job front. On the inflation front, the, the concern is that if you have a 2% inflation objective and inflation expectations, which are a very important driver of inflation itself, if inflation expectations slip, that can put the, the actual attainment of an inflation objective at risk. And Japan seems like a case, an extreme case, where that's happened. And think, of, think about it this way. Um, if um, in a world of very low interest rates, it's estimated that 30 or 40 percent of the time in the future, if rates stay as low as they look to be now and to stay that way, 30 percent of or 40 percent of the time, the Fed could be operating with zero interest rates. Um, it, it, times when they would ideally like to set negative interest rates, maybe highly negative interest rates, but can't. During those times, inflation is likely to slip below 2%. We saw six or seven years where that happened. Now, suppose the Fed just shoots for 2% when it's not constrained. 
and it can achieve um, at least its objective on average. Then you have, say, 60% of the time when inflation averages 2%, and 30 or 40% of the time when it averages below 2%. And that sounds like an average below 2%. And, you know, if you're forming inflation expectations and that's the strategy, you would be wise to assume that inflation will average below 2%. And that can pull inflation down over time. And that's, that's a problem. The other problem is on the employment front, um, it's important that the Fed have tools available when short rates have been lowered to zero. And I think this forward guidance or the pledge that short rates will stay low for a long time is a potent way to bring down long-term rates. Well, if um, the Fed can only make such a pledge if it's credible, and if the Fed really intends to keep short rates low for a very long time, as would be desirable to promote recovery in the job market, um, then it needs to wait a long time to begin to raise rates um, during an expansion. And a consequence would likely be that would inflation would end up overshooting 2%. So those two things dovetail together, to my mind, into a strategy that would be good going forward, both for um, uh, regaining um, jobs following a downturn and also for, for achieving 2% um, inflation. Hi, I'm wondering if you can describe what you see as the most important qualifications for nominee uh, for the uh, Board of Governors. <laughs> yes, um, the, happy to. <laughs> So I think th the Fed has a long tradition, and as my successor, Chair Powell, has said, it's built into the culture and the, f the, effort, the Fed's DNA to make decisions in an objective, analytic, fact-based, and non-political way, and a willingness to um, approach the work of um, in monetary policy and in other aspects of the Fed's work, but importantly in monetary policy in a nonpartisan, fact-based and collegial and non-political way I consider to be a requirement for the effective functioning of the Federal Reserve. And um, I've not, I've, I've spent many years serving on the Federal Open Market Committee the transcripts of all of those discussions are made public. There's a long record of them with a five-year lag. And you can read through those transcripts, and you will not see any discussion of politics. Political arguments are not made. And so I think the willingness to approach this work um, that the Congress has assigned the FOMC a mandate of price stability and maximum employment, and working collegially with others to think through um, what is really happening in the economy, what are the risks, and what is the best way to achieve them. Those are crucial candidate, crucial requirements to serve um, on the Federal Reserve. Um, so in terms of background, there are quite a few PhD economists who serve on the FOMC, and that's a relevant background, but I don't regard that as an absolute requirement. Um, individuals who have had experience in financial markets or um, in business but understand um, issues pertaining to financial markets have served and can serve um, very effectively on the FOMC. But, um, independent, non-political, um, analytic, fact-based are, are critical. Hi, um, thanks for being here and for taking Thank my you. question. Um, I'm wondering if there are any aspects of the Dodd-Frank statute or regime that you would highlight as um, ripe for uh, tailoring or revision. So. Um, for me personally, I think it makes sense to incorporate initial margin in calculating the supplementary leverage ratio. Um, I don't know if there are things you're working on now um, that you'd like to highlight here. 
So the issue about initial margin and the supplementary leverage ratio. You don't have to take that it, specifically. It's a, but. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a pretty technical issue, and um, it's one that does have significance for a number of financial institutions and market participants. I don't, I don't believe that requires a change in Dodd-Frank. I think that's, I believe that that's something that could be addressed by the banking agencies through um, their regulatory authority, and there are pros and cons of changing it. Um, I, I think with respect to Dodd-Frank, um, I suppose I'm most concerned, as I mentioned, about emergency lending powers and the scaling back of the Fed's so-called 13-3 authority to lend to individual firms in a financial crisis. I really think that that's a, that's a mistake um, and could be very consequential. Um, I do worry about the absence of so-called macroprudential tools. You know, as I mentioned, many countries, when they see, um, for example, a housing bubble forming, or a credit bubble um, would give um, it their authorities, and this is often um, some sort of a financial stability board that countries have set up to look at risks in the country to financial stability. Um, these boards have tools that they can invoke because they see market developments that pose financial stability risk to the country. Um, a good example is um, in the United Kingdom, um, the Bank of England has a separate financial stability committee. That committee has several tools, including limits on um, loan-to-value ratios in mortgage lending that they can put in place, not because they're worried about the health of any particular bank or even banks in general, but because they're worried about the economic consequences of what they see as house dangerous house price appreciation that may be a bubble that when it bursts can um, do significant long-term economic damage to the country. And um, we don't have those powers, Dodd-Frank, uh, didn't include them, and that um, particularly particularly worries me. I mentioned um, leverage lending, my concern about corporate lending, and that's um, I think that's an example of where such a macro prudential tool might have been used. Now, I guess I should say I don't believe this will be responsible for the next financial crisis. I don't think it's the same scale of worry as subprime lending before the crisis, but I do consider it an example of a development that's likely to make the next recession worse uh, when, whenever that occurs and um, ought to have been something that regulators could address. Hi, Dr. Allen. Thank you for being here and for taking this question. Thank you. Uh, you've spoken a little bit about Dodd-Frank. Um, as you know, when Dodd-Frank was passed, there were massive exemptions carved out for real estate in particular. Um, and as a result, a lot of the money that was once flowing to Swiss banks has been parked in real estate in New York, in Miami, in LA, and a lot of American cities. In your view, how would you think about regulations uh, as they pertain to real estate and how we can clean up some of the real estate sector. I must confess, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to in Dodd-Frank that pertains to real estate. Uh, what I'm referring to specifically is the fact that um, a lot of the same background checks uh, that are required for other sectors of the financial markets are not actually included. Um, so as a result, you know, for example, uh, you can set up anonymous corporations and invest in housing in the United States um, to park money here as a form of what I would consider laundering. So uh, you're asking me a question about details. I confess I, you know, this is not in the Fed's um, domain of authority. And I confess I really haven't thought deeply about, about what the rules are. Certainly banks face um, rules in real estate area in terms of the checks that they need to do. Um, 
But, I mean, you may be right that it's an area where abuses are taking place. It, that certainly wasn't the intention of Dodd-Frank to um, address that. I'm not sure that was critical in the housing in the housing boom and bust either, but perhaps it was. All right, thank you. Okay. Dr. Allen, thank you for being here uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, we, learned our, we learned in our economics class that uh, low interest rates lead to inflation, as too, too much money chases too few goods. What it seems to have happened is uh, it's too much goods that are being produced with too much money rather than the other way. So do you think keeping rates lower for a long time leads to deflation, as we've seen with crude prices or commercial properties? So um, many people said after the financial crisis when the Fed went out mm -hmm. and bought the three and a half trillion dollars of assets that I mentioned and um, paid for it by creating electronic money or bank reserves, that that would be inflationary. And in fact, there was a full page ad that many conservative economists signed criticizing it and saying that it would be inflationary. Well, um, I, um, Bernanke and I and our colleagues strongly disagreed. We um, went ahead and did it against that advice. And as I mentioned, um, inflation has run, on, run under 2% for at least seven years and is barely up to 2% now. So um, there is a certain truth in the idea that money can cause inflation, but there are important caveats and provisos. When an economy is operating at full employment and, the, and resources are, in some sense, fully employed, then printing large amounts of money um, certainly can um, boost demand and, in a fully employed economy, um, create inflationary pressures. And uh, if you look around the globe, most instances of high or hyperinflation come when there are large government budget deficits and central banks um, uh, help finance those by printing money. So I wouldn't argue against the idea that there is an important link between money and inflation, but that just isn't the case uh, in an economy that's suffering from a shortage of demand when, as you said, there are too many goods and not enough demand for those goods. And that's that's the situation that the U.S. economy faced from 2008 until very recently. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Yellen. Um, so as I'm sure you know, with the testimony that Tim Sloan provided Congress two weeks ago, as well as the negative feedback that the OCC and the CFPB provide them with, it doesn't seem like they're too uh, inclined to remove the asset cap that you placed on Wells Fargo just two years ago. So as both the Wells Fargo account holder and uh, an employee at the FDIC who is currently uh, reviewing Wells Fargo, I would like to ask you if you could just name a couple changes or developments that you'd like to see the management of Wells Fargo pr produce in order before you'd even consider lifting that asset cap personally. So I think Wells Fargo was, was guilty of very serious control breakdowns in its um, consumer operation that led to a variety of abuses that where it is paid penalties, um, both um, opening fraudulent accounts and other things for consumers, and further abuses have been um, identified in the lending and um, insurance requirements and other things. Um, the Federal Reserve supervises um, the holding company of Wells Fargo, and a critical function of the holding company is to make sure that there is an adequate control environment um, over the activities of the entire firm. And um, the Federal Reserve found that there were such significant control deficiencies in the way Wells Fargo was operated that um, during my term, actually it was the last day of my term, um, we, we um, had, had um, 
we, pl we placed on Wells Fargo this asset cap. It's something unusual, but um, Wells Fargo is a very large organization, felt that it should not grow larger until it had addressed these deficiencies. Now, I cannot tell you concretely what will be necessary in order for the Fed to make a decision to, re to remove that cap. Um, that'll be a supervisory judgment that the Fed supervisors will review the steps that Wells has taken and the effectiveness of the procedures that are put in place. And um, the board will have to render a judgment that it feels that um, sufficient remedies have taken place and they have not yet made that determination. Thank you. Ben. Hello. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on Jamie McAndrew's narrow bank proposal? Okay. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I don't know if people... Do you want to explain a little bit to people in the audience what sure. that is? Because sure. my, my guess is that the number of people sitting here who know what that is is probably small. Yeah, they form a bank uh, for institutional investors to park deposits at the Fed. They don't make loans like traditional retail banks do, and they pay their investors a larger uh, interest rate than retail banks would pay their borrowers. Yes, so the, the idea is to set up a very special institution that would take deposits from um, institutional customers and park them at the Federal Reserve where they would bear interest. Banks can earn interest on those reserves. There are some um, institutions that um, are not able, many institutions, that are not able to, uh, this would include Fannie and Freddie, the federal home loan banks, and money market funds more generally, um, that are not able to make uh, deposits that pay interest at the Fed. And this would arbitrage that out so that they would take deposits from these entities and hold them at the Fed and be able to pay um, higher, higher interest. There are a lot of technical issues around this. Um, this is something that only works if um, this bank doesn't have to hold capital. Um, that's a, an important judgment that, uh, you know, certainly deposits at the Federal Reserve are a safe asset, um, and that's a reason not to have to hold capital, but they're operational. Um, issues that could result in losses. So regulators would need to um, decide that um, it was possible uh, not, you know, for it not to hold meaningful amount of capital. There are other regulatory issues in connection, I believe, with this bank, whether or not it would be exempt from um, paying deposit insurance, which would reduce the profitability. You know, this is an arbitrage that uh, former Fed people have um, created. Um, I, is there a great social gain to society from approving this? I don't think there's a tremendous social gain from doing it, but there are regulatory issues that the Fed and others will have to determine Thank you. in connection with it. Hi, Dr. Yellen. Thank you uh, for being here to talk uh, with us. Um, so my question is, reflecting on recent history of the financial crisis, what are your thoughts about the result of Lehman Brothers, and would you have done something differently? So that's an excellent question, and there's a lot of controversy over it. Um, you know, what I, what I can tell you is that I have tremendous respect for my colleagues who were um, on the scene and had to call the shots that weekend. And I have listened very carefully to um, their explanations of um, the options that they had and the decisions that they made. So um, 
they discovered, I believe, by Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening of Lehman weekend that the plans that they um, were trying to put in place for Lehman to be acquired by Barclays or another firm had fallen through. Um, Lehman was not going to be able to um, open for business the next morning um, unless that kind of deal had been arrived at or the Fed and the Treasury did something extraordinary um, that evening. They had a matter of hours to figure this out, and I think um, when the Barclays deal fell apart, what they saw was that there was no meaningful future for Lehman. Without an acquirer um, and with customers running from Lehman and taking their business away, this was an entity that um, getting it through 24 hours or 48 hours um, without crashing was not going to rescue this as a viable entity without finding some merger partner. This was essentially a doomed um, enterprise. And uh, I think they felt under those conditions and given what they've said was an absence of sufficient collateral that they really felt they had no choice. Uh, and it was not a decision that they happily made um, to let Lehman go into bankruptcy. I don't think there were good options. I know there has been um, a book, an interesting book by Larry Ball that looks at the question of whether or not Lehman was solvent and whether or not there was sufficient collateral. Um, I, I would tell you that you know this was a crisis situation um, with hours to make a decision and three people who had um, Paulson, Geithner, Bernanke, who had no higher priority than stemming a financial crisis, um, who made the best decision that they could under the circumstances. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, My pleasure. I, I apologize in advance for having a slightly less technical question, but sure. I'm just really curious. Uh, what sort of conversations happen in a household of two prominent economists? <laughs> So wait, I have a clarification. Did you say two? Yes. <laughs> what sort of conversations happen in a family of prominent economists? So the truth is we're a household of three <laughs> economists. Um, we have a son who also has a PhD in economics. <laughs> and uh, he currently lives in London and um, teaches, teaches in England, um, but we remain very close. And um, if, you, if you were to make the obvious guess, you would not be wrong. Uh, we, we talk about economics a lot. We have, some, we, have some other, we have some other interests and topics of conversation, but it's not unusual. Uh, I, th I think that you would, if you lived in our household, find a diet that's perhaps richer than in economics than you might find appetizing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing with us. Thank you very much, Jimmy Massa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to uh, express my appreciation to President DeJoya and especially to the Tanis family for this wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.